There is no substitute for the preaching and teaching of God's Word. Each weekday on Enjoying the Journey, Scott Pauley leads us in a brief study of Scripture. Today, on the Weekend Pulpit, we are happy to share a full-length Bible message given through Scott's pulpit ministry. These messages were recorded live in a local church or gospel event in recent days. It is our prayer that the message will be a help to you today. told the sound men if they'd just record the first message and play it, I'd try to lip sync this time. So we'll see if that works. All right, fellas. Uh, great to see all of you. And what a great crowd this morning. We had a great crowd in the early service. And then this is tremendous. And I have met a number of West Virginia Mountaineers in the last hour or so. How many of you are from West Virginia? I'm just curious. Would you raise your hand? That's great. How many of you have been to West Virginia? How many of you know West Virginia's a state? Would you raise your hand? That's good. Yeah, it started in the Civil War. And uh, I uh, and your pastor and I have this in common, and we have many things in common, but I've been looking forward to being with him and being with all of you. What a great privilege. And uh, this is a special time in the life and ministry of your church. I know we'll talk more about that this week, but I'm honored to be here with you, and I really, really mean that and covet your prayers. I want you to take your copy of the Word of God and go with me, if you will, in the New Testament to the book of Second Corinthians. And once you get to the chapter that I'm going to bring you to, I want you to take your little Bible ribbon or your marker some way to mark this passage of Scripture because God helping us, I intend to stay in one chapter of the Bible in the next three days. So we're just going to pitch our tent here and set camp and dig in, find all that God has for us. We're not going to exhaust it because it's the Word of God. You can never exhaust it. But I want to study 2 Corinthians chapter 10 with you. And once you find it, you'll notice, of course, it's a fairly short chapter, 18 verses long is all. But the reason I'm bringing you to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, frankly, is not for you. Now, I'm praying God will use it in your life. But I'm going to preach to myself this week and let you listen. Is that all right with you? Because this chapter of the Bible, the Holy Spirit has been using the last two weeks in my life in a very definite way. In fact, last Sunday, last Sunday... I was preaching in South Dakota. <laughs> you know, the weather was a little different there last Sunday. It snowed there last Sunday. And uh, I was preaching in South Dakota. I was not preaching from this portion of the Bible. And uh, last Sunday evening, the Lord took me to this portion of Scripture, uh, just alone, my own private time with God, and really worked me over. You ever have the Holy Spirit work you over? And uh, all week this week, I've just been chewing on it, meditating on it, and so I believe this is what God has for us this week, and I'm trusting that the Lord will meet every need in every one of our lives from the all-sufficient Word of God. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10, beginning in verse number 1. Paul writes, Now I, Paul, myself, beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence and base among you, but being absent and bold towards you, that I beseech you, that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence wherewith I think to be bold against some which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. You get the idea immediately there's some strife. <laughs> there's a little contention. Somewhere <clears throat> there's a conflict. Can I let you in a little secret? There's always a conflict. There's always contention. There's always strife. We'll talk more about this this evening, but there's no perfect place and there's no perfect people. You have a great church. <clears throat> I pulled on the parking lot early this morning, saw people coming in and sensed the Spirit of the Lord and just talking to people. This is great. I mean, this is, God is doing something in this place. But can I tell you the dirty secret about your church? The dirty secret about this church is that it's filled with sinners. Say, how do you know that? Because we're all sinners. 
Look at the person next to you right now. Everybody turn. Look at the person next to you. You see that person next to you? You're looking at a certified sinner right now. That's what you're looking at. And in case you're wondering, they're looking at one too. And you're listening to one right now. We're all just sinners. I trust saved sinners. And we may even be dressed up sinners. Don't we dress up nice for church? But we're still just a bunch of black-hearted, hell-deserving sinners. And you know what we need? We need Jesus. And it's fascinating to me that in this chapter where, look, he's about to talk pretty rough to them. I mean, he's going to get beneath the surface. He's going to get down to the nitty-gritty where they live. In fact, he's going to get down where nobody goes but you and God to your thoughts, to your motives, to your desires. But before he gets to all that, here's where he starts. Oh, I love this. Thank you, Lord, for this. Look at verse number 1. He says, Now I, Paul, myself beseech you by, would you mark this expression in your Bible, the meekness and gentleness of Christ. Spurgeon used to say, Take a text from anywhere in the Bible. Go ahead. Take a text from anywhere in the Bible. Then make a beeline for Jesus. I like that. Well, may I say, start at any place in your life with any spiritual need that you have, with anything you're dealing with, or any person you're dealing with, and make a beeline for Jesus. Because it's only in Christ that we find what we need. i got to tell you, the temptation for us preachers, when you come to a book like Corinthians, is to talk about their carnality, their fleshliness, their sinfulness, their argument, their... You understand what I mean. Isn't it easy to preach against somebody else's sin? In fact, in most places where I go, people say they want revival. They don't really want revival. What they want is everybody else to get right with God. Go ahead, preacher. Give it to him. He he really needs this sermon. Boy, I'm glad she's here this morning. She needed this. You never have a revival that way. Never. It's not my brother, not my sister, but it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. And so you come to a book like Corinthians and you look at their carnality. Let me tell you a little, a little open secret. God never gave us a picture of people in Scripture so we would know them better. He gave us them in Scripture so we would see ourselves better. This is not a telescope to look back in history or a microscope to pick somebody else apart. This is a mirror that shows us what we really are. The book of Corinthians is not about their carnality. The book of Corinthians is about my carnality and about your carnality. You want to see real revival? Stop waiting on Washington to get right with God. Stop waiting on lost people to get right with God and let judgment begin at the house of God. And when God's people see themselves like they really are and see Jesus like he really is, it will forever change us. I love the first word of the chapter. What's the first word of the chapter, church? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. What's the first word of the chapter? Now. How many of you believe there's power in one word from the word? Do you find it significant that Paul's dealing in the present tense? Let me tell you something about the God of the Bible. He's never a past tense God, and he's not a future tense God. He's a present tense God. Lord, tell us your name. Okay, I am. I am what? Yes. All the above. The self-existent, self-sufficient, eternal God who's in the ever-present now. And might I say to you, when we open 2 Corinthians, we're not opening a history book. God is opening us. And he's dealing with us right where we are. And he's speaking to us right where we are. Let me just tell this church, I don't know you. I don't know you. I don't know a handful of people in this room. And I did not ask the pastor any questions on purpose. I don't want to know. I don't want to know. What I want to do is stand up and preach the Bible and let the God who knows all of us meet us right where we are. And here's what I've come to believe. If Corinth needed Christ, guess what we need? We need Christ. Run to Jesus. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of this world will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. I believe more than I've ever believed in my life in the all-sufficiency of the written word and the all-sufficiency of the living word. The word of God is enough and the Christ of God is enough. 
Old Vance Habner, that North Carolina evangelist, used to say, revival is just this. It's God's people falling in love with Jesus all over again. This is not about Paul, and this is not about this preacher. This is not about these people, and this is not about you. No, my friend, it's all about Jesus Christ. Roy Hessian was a man who was greatly used to the Lord. He wrote a classic book, you ought to read it, called The Calvary Road. Every, every Christian ought to read The Calvary Road. Roy Hessian was a man who knew the Lord, walked with God, filled with the Holy Spirit, and he, he saw revival in other parts of the world. He saw real revival in a unique way. I have a friend who pastors a church outside of Baltimore, and several years ago I was preaching for him. He was taking me back early on a Wednesday morning to Baltimore Airport to catch a flight, and we were just talking as we went, and he said to me, you ever heard the name Roy Hessian? I said, of course. Calvary Road. And uh, I said, it's a great book. He said, I met him. I said, you're kidding me. He said, no, before he went to heaven, I heard him preach in a Bible conference. And I said, well, tell me about that. He said, well, it wasn't the sermons that I remember. He said, it was not the public meetings that I remember. He said, it was a private conversation I had with him that changed me. He said, I was walking through the basement of that church between those conference sessions, and he said, the lights were dark, nobody was down there, and I said, I was just making my way through the corridor. He said, I looked over in the corner, and there sat old Dr. Hessian, up in years, sitting on a folding chair by himself with his Bible open on his lap. And my friend said, I didn't want to interrupt him, but I thought, if I don't speak to him now, I'll probably never meet him until I get to heaven. He said, I went over to him and introduced myself. He said, he was so gracious to talk with me. And he said he recounted the great revivals that he'd seen and what the Lord had done. And he said, as I turned to leave, I asked him, Dr. Hessian, do you think America will ever see real revival? He said, the old gentleman took a deep breath and sighed and said, when Jesus is enough, then you will have your revival. I must tell you, I couldn't get it off my mind. In fact, hundreds of times. I don't think any exaggeration. Hundreds of times since that day, the Holy Spirit has brought that back to my mind. You know what I think has happened to us? I think we've gotten so consumed with ourselves, so consumed with our world, how terrible Corinth is, so consumed with everybody else around us that we've not let Jesus be enough to us. Could it be that we've become professional Christians now? who've learned the motions and mechanics of it all, who, who sing the hymns, who say amen at the right times, who get a page full of notes and a head full of knowledge, but a heart empty of Jesus. Could it be that we have missed the very one who is life himself, the very one who stood in the garden and said, Lazarus, come forth, and he came forth? Hey, revival's not hard. You think revival's hard to the God who spoke life into Adam to start with? Revival can happen in an instant. What's hard is getting us to the place where we stop looking at everybody else and we get our eyes back on Jesus Christ. I say to you what we need is a fresh glimpse of Jesus. We need to see the meekness and gentleness of Christ. Would you mark that expression in your Bible right here in verse number 1? The meekness and gentleness of Christ. And let me just show you a little context to the text. See, every, every verse is connected to all the other verses around it. You do understand the chapter and verse divisions are not inspired, right? I'm glad we have them. We'd all still be looking for 2 Corinthians chapter 10 right now. But I want you to back up and look at the end of chapter 9. Look at verse 14. By their prayer for you which long after you for the exceeding grace of God in you. Well, how'd you get the exceeding grace of God in you? What is the exceeding grace of God in you? Look at verse number 15. Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. May I tell you that the unspeakable gift of God is not a thing, it's a person. The unspeakable gift of God, the means by which the exceeding grace of God has come to live and dwell in us is the person of Jesus Christ. Watch this, please. He ends chapter 9 by talking about all we've received in Jesus. But now don't miss it. When you come to chapter 10, he's showing you the difference that ought to make in your life. How many of you know you're saved? 39 years ago. 39 years ago, a lady, not a preacher, a lady, took a Bible and shared Jesus with me, and I got saved. 39 years ago, Jesus came to live in my house. You believe that? 
I tell you, it's wonderful to be a Christian. You can't beat being a Christian. He comes to live in your house now, and you get to go live in his house for all eternity. That's a pretty good deal. 39 years ago, that happened. You remember the day you got saved? Was it a good day? The hymn writer said, glad day, glad day when Jesus washed my sins away. You know what I think has happened to us? I think that we sit around and talk about how great the unspeakable gift of God was, how wonderful it is to be saved. Look at chapter 10, verse 1, and we miss what Jesus is doing in us now. The present tense Christ. The difference he's to make in our life at this moment. Well, what is it? Run to Jesus. Both letters, I noticed this last night. 1 Corinthians, you know how it begins? 1 Corinthians chapter 1, he brings him to Jesus. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, you know how it begins? He brings him to Jesus. Sounds to me like he just keeps taking the Corinthians by the hand and say, I know, I know you all having a hard time. Come with me, I'm going to take you to Jesus. I know you all fighting among yourselves. Let me tell you what will fix that. Come on, let's go talk to Jesus about it. I know you're struggling with that lust. I'm going to tell you, the only thing that's going to help you conquer that, come on, I'm going to take you to Jesus. I'm going to tell you what the Holy Spirit's trying to do in all of our lives today. He's trying to take us by the hand, maybe I should say take us by the heart, and lead us into the presence of Jesus Christ. But let's look at this scripture. Look at verse number one. The meekness and gentleness of Christ. Would you write two or three thoughts down to meditate on them? Number one, I want you to see in this the reality of who Christ is. Forget me. <clears throat> Look, I don't care if you remember my name. It's meaningless to me. Meaningless to me. I didn't come to impress you this week. I don't care if you remember my sermons. <laughs> I don't anticipate most of you are going to remember the outlines and the illustrations and all that kind of thing. I'll tell you what I'm praying this week. I'm praying, oh, Lord, show us Jesus. Lord, let us love Jesus more. When all is done, let Christ be admired. Let the Lord be adored. He's the only one worthy of it anyhow. You see, what the Holy Spirit is doing here in the very first verse of this chapter is he's showing us the reality of who Christ is, of his beautiful nature, of his perfect character, of the loveliness of Christ. I'm going to tell you what we're doing. We're living right now in harsh days. Have you watched the news lately? <laughs> if you haven't, congratulations, don't start. And if you have, you know exactly what I'm talking about. In my lifetime, I have never seen so much hate. I have n never seen so much bickering and fighting and strife and contention. May I tell you, the only thing that contrasts with that hatred is the meekness and gentleness of Christ. You know what this world needs right now? It needs Jesus. By the way, the only way the world's going to get it is if we get a fresh glimpse of him. Look over to the next chapter. Look at chapter 11, verse number 1. Would to God ye could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, look at verse 3, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from would you read this expression out loud with me, church? Ready? The simplicity that is in Christ. Do you see the beautiful simplicity of Christ? It's a complex age. By the way, sin makes an everlasting mess of everything it touches. It complicates marriages. It messes up children and parent relationships. It divides churches. It messes with your mind. I'm telling you, sin complicates every thing it touches and the only thing that can cut through that mess in your life in your heart in your home in our world is the simplicity that is in jesus christ interesting isn't it that here at the end of the book of corinthians and at the end of the age and believers living at the end of the new testament he takes us all the way back to the garden of eden and he says look what the devil did with eve you know what eve had a simple life how many of you look back on your childhood and youth and think, you know, it really was much simpler then, yes? And you read in history and you say, those really were simple days. I wish we could go back to that. Well, let me share the simplest time. Can you imagine living in the Garden of Eden? I mean, we're talking about the, the only woman in history that can say she had a perfect husband. That was Eve. She lived in the perfect place. Everything was in order exactly like it ought to be. Life was simple then. Do you know why it was simple? Watch this. Because it was just man and the Lord. 
And then there was that moment, God help us, when the serpent slithered into that garden. By the way, the devil's looking for a place in your home too. And it doesn't take much room for a snake to get through either. And when he comes, he taints life with sin, and he brings terrible complication and complexity to it. The only thing that will fix it is run to Jesus. Only the simplicity of Christ can fix what ails every last one of us. Let me show you something interesting. Go back to verse number 1 of chapter 10. What is it specifically about Christ? It is here his meekness and gentleness. You know, honestly, we're living in a world today where people don't mind talking about Jesus, but it is not the Christ of Scripture. It's the Christ of their own imagination. We've constructed a Christ that is palatable to us that we like. And based on your personality and experience, he's different for everybody. Some people just love his miracles. Oh, they love to talk about his miracles. Now, his teachings, they're not too interested in his teachings as long as they can get his miracles. And then there's some people, the only Christ they know is the Christ that made a scourge of whips and went into the temple and drove out the money changers. They like that. They like that. And they built their entire Christianity around an imaginary Christ who they think was just full of anger all the time. Might I say to you that our Lord was not one attribute or the other. He was all of them, and he was the perfection of all of them. Let me prove it. Go back to Matthew 21 with me real quick, just real fast. Go to Matthew chapter 21. Here's the story where he drove out the money changers. Did you ever make this connection in your Bible? Look at Matthew 21. As he's coming into the city, look at verse number 5, what it says. Tell ye the daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh unto thee. And what's the next word? Matthew 21, verse number 5. Thy king cometh unto thee. What's the word, church? Meek. Remember, the meekness and gentleness of Christ. Meekness is rarely ever associated with a king, but it is our king. Do you know why? Because our king is a righteous king. Our king is a perfect king. Our king is the king of glory. Excuse me. Our king has nothing to prove. He has nothing to prove to any man because he is who he has always been and who he will always be. He's the meek king. By the way, in Jesus' first message in Matthew chapter 5, he said, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. I'm telling you, this is what his kingdom looks like, the meekness and gentleness of Christ. And watch this. Immediately after identifying him that way, if you look at verse number 12, Jesus goes in the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and over the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold up. So watch. The guy kicking over tables and driving out the money changers is the one that God says he's the meek one. You see the perfect character of our Christ? But now watch this. Meekness is not just who he is. It's how he deals with us. I'm thinking about my life right now. See, I know me better than you know me. And God knows me better than I know me. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? We're all just sinners. And if it were not for the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I'm going to tell you where every one of us would be today. We'd all be in hell or we'd be on our way to hell. But hallelujah, I'm not there and I'm never going there because of the meekness and gentleness of Christ. You're in Matthew. Back up a few pages. Look at Matthew chapter 11. You know this passage. Look at verse 28. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. I'll give you rest. Some of you weighed down right now. Some of you in this room right now listening to me, you're weighed down. Some of you with your sin, some terrible thing from the past. The devil's using it like a club, beating you over the head with it. Jesus said, come on, come to me. I know you're weighted down with it. I'll give you rest in a restless world. Look at verse 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. And we say, oh, yes, Lord, I'd like to learn of you. What are we going to learn of him? Look at it. He said, I'm meek and lowly in heart. And you shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The first thing you learn about Jesus is his meekness and his gentleness. By the way, did you know that the, the word the Greeks used for meekness here was a word they used for animals that had been broken and had been brought under control of something? It's interesting Jesus would use that word here with the yoke. What's he saying? Look, I'm yielded to the Father. I, I'm under his control. And if you'll get in the yoke with me and you'll get under his control and you'll be yielded, you'll know this meekness and gentleness too. 
Turn one page to chapter 12. You're close. Look at chapter 12. Verse number 18, a quote from Isaiah that Christ fulfilled. Behold, my servant whom I've chosen, my beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. What marks the spirit of God on a man? Look at verse 19. He shall not strive nor cry, neither shall any man hear his voice in the streets. That doesn't mean Jesus didn't lift up his voice. To speak the truth, it meant that he didn't try to do it in the energy of flesh and make his point and out-talk somebody else. The Pharisees did that, not Jesus. Look at the next verse, verse 20. A bruised reed shall he not break. And smoking flax shall he not quench till he send forth judgment unto victory. And in his name shall the Gentiles trust. Hey, that's us. Don't you love finding yourself in the Bible? We're the Gentiles. Why do we get to trust him? Look at, look at verse number 20. He gives two illustrations. He said, first, a bruised reed he won't break. Reeds were common in that day. Scribes used them. Did you know that? People who wrote used reeds. They would cut a reed. They'd find a nice one that was not broken, not bruised. They would sharpen its tip. They would dip it in the ink of the day, and they would write with it. And at some point, that reed would get so saturated with the ink that it became pliable. It became uh, bruised, broken. And so what would they do? It was meaningless. It was useless then. They would just wrap it up, throw it away, and get another one. Jesus says, I don't do that. When the reed gets bruised, I mend it. I heal it. Anybody in this room glad Jesus doesn't throw you away? The shepherds used the reed. They, they would cut down a reed. They tell me those ancient shepherds, they had a little hole through that reed. They could blow through. It was a makeshift flute. And they said that the shepherds, the ancient shepherds of that day would use the reed to blow. And the sheep would hear the, the, the noise coming through the reed. And they would follow along behind the shepherd. And sometimes that reed would get bruised. And when it got bruised, guess what? It never made a song again. And Jesus, the good shepherd, comes along and says, I know, I know your life is weak. I know your life is bruised. I know you've got problems, but I want you to know I can touch it in such a way you can sing again. I, I can bring the melody and the harmony and the joy back to your life. A bruised reed, he doesn't break. And then, look at it, a smoking flax. He doesn't quench. The lanterns of the temple and the lights around a house it had a little wick that was flax, and sometimes that flax would burn down so much that finally it just smoked. There was no light. There was no fire, and it stunk. It put off a terrible odor, and it burned the eyes. And you know what you do with a smoking flax? You quench it. You go and you put it out. You, you let it stop smoldering. Jesus said, I don't do that. No, I don't do that at all. Here's what I do. I trim the wick. I put a little more oil in, and I light it again. In other words, Jesus said, I'm not going to throw you away. I'm going to meet you right where you are. You know what that is? That's the meekness and gentleness of Christ. Go back to our text, would you please, very quickly. Let me show you a couple things. What is the reality of Christ in this meekness and gentleness? Meek and gentle, those are two different things. Can I explain them to you quickly? Would you write this down somewhere? First of all, meekness is Godward. It's a Godward word. You might say it this way, that's the inside. That's the internal part. Uh, meekness, for example, the Bible said Moses was the meekest man that ever lived. And yet he got angry. He killed a man. He hit a rock one time when he wasn't supposed to. Meekness is not what you see on the outside. Meekness is what God sees. Meekness literally means that you are under control. Oh, I love this. What marked the Lord Jesus Christ? He came to do the will of the Father who sent him. He was under the control of another. There was never a moment, think of this, never a moment in 33 and a half years that Jesus was not under the perfect control of the Father, under the perfect control of the indwelling Holy Spirit, and under the perfect control of his own divine nature as the eternal son. He was always under control. Hey, even when he had a whip in his hand, driving out the money changers, he wasn't out of control. He was under control. I'm going to tell you the problem with most of us. The problem with most of us is we're not under control. By the way, if I want to know what kind of Christian you are, I wouldn't ask your pastor. Sorry. I'd ask the people that live at your house. Because they know. You want to know what kind of preacher I am? You can listen to a sermon. You want to know what kind of Christian I am? You'll have to ask Tammy and Morgan and Lauren and Grant. Because they know. 
See, none of us is a better Christian than the Christian we are in the privacy of our own home. You don't put on meekness for Sunday school. Mm -mm. No, meekness means at every moment in life you are yielded to the lordship of our God just like Christ was yielded to the will of the Father. There's meekness. And then, look at the second one. There's not only meekness, there's what, church? There is gentleness. And I tell you, one grows out of the other. Watch. If meekness is this way, it's Godward, then gentleness is this way, it's manward. Do you know why there's so much harshness in this world? People say, yeah, folks are mean to each other. That's not the problem. The problem is they don't have Jesus in his rightful place. See, when you're right this way, you'll be right this way. When things are in their proper priority and placement in your life, Godward, I'm going to tell you what the Lord will do. He'll put his gentle nature, his gentle spirit inside of you. The first one is internal. The second one is external. And I'm going to tell you what's happened in American churches. We've gotten pretty good at putting on, pardon me, the Instagram filter for public consumption of our Christianity, but we've not dealt thoroughly with Christ being in his rightful place in our life. And until Jesus is right in here, nothing's going to be right out there. And after a while, the facade falls. You want revival? Then Jesus must be enough. Number one, we see the reality of Christ. Number two, would you write this down, please, somewhere? We see it, his reflection in us. This is a very practical passage. The Apostle Paul is actually dealing with real people in a real place who had real problems. And here's what I've discovered. I've discovered that just as Paul reflected the meekness and gentleness of Christ, you and I are supposed to reflect the meekness and gentleness of Christ. Years ago, years ago, I read the story of a young boy who was living on the streets of Chicago, if I remember the story correctly. He was not cared for. Shoes had holes in them. Clothes were tattered. Face was dirty. Hadn't eaten in days. A kind, well-dressed well-to-do woman was walking down the street and she saw him she had pity on him she said son have you eaten recently and he said no ma'am she said you come with me and she took him into a diner and sat him down and said to the waiter now look whatever he wants he can have that boy ordered table full of food ate every bit of it he never had a meal like that At the end of the meal she walked him across the street into a department store she said to the man in the boys department she said i want the best coat you have a hat gloves New boots for him. I want him to have new clothes. She bought him the nicest things in the store. That little boy had never been treated that way before. They walked out on the street corner after he'd got his belly full and his body warm. He's got all these new clothes on him. He looks at her and he says, can I ask you a question? She said, certainly. He said, are you Jesus' mother? And she said, no. But he's my savior. And the little boy said, I knew you were related to him somehow. And when I read it long ago, I got under such conviction. Because I thought to myself, I wonder when the last time was somebody had an interaction with me and thought, that man must be related to Jesus. Sir, when was the last time somebody looked at your life and thought of Christ? When was the last time your wife looked at your love and thought of Christ? Ma'am, when was the last time somebody you, you deal with or your own children saw the beautiful nature and character of Jesus Christ? Look, the only beauty in any of us, we're all just sinners. The only beauty in any of us must be Jesus Christ. And I love this, that Paul, even with all of his apostolic authority, doesn't come to the church at Corinth and say, I'm going to straighten you out. You listen to me. You ought to listen to me. He comes and says, I beseech you. Twice he says, I beg you. I beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. My dad said to me as a boy, he said, son, there's a difference between reacting and responding. He said, when you react, just react to somebody, almost without exception, that's flesh. That's your old sin nature. You got ticked off. You're going to straighten them out. You're going to fix that. And he said, that's sin. 
He said, but if you can learn, instead of reacting to respond, that's not flesh, that's spirit. If you can get to the place where you say to the Lord, Lord, I want to be under such your control, that's meekness, that in all my dealings with others, that there's gentleness. Lord, I want to be so close to you that I reflect in what I say and in my spirit, the way I say it, the beauty and the loveliness of Jesus Christ. There's nothing more attractive than that. I served for nearly 20 years with Brother Sexton in Knoxville. He was kind to me. He invested in me. On Sunday night, I was preaching at the church, at Temple Baptist Church. Normally, when I preached, he was gone. He was there that night. I do not remember the message that I preached. I only remember I quoted a verse that night at the end of the meeting. After we talked with people, he and I were walking to our cars. Just the two of us in the parking lot. I'll never forget this. He encouraged me said kind things, and then he got a little smile on his face and chuckled, and he said, now, you did misquote one verse tonight. And I said, I did? He said, yes. He said, you said life and death are in the power of the tongue. I said, right. He said, wrong. He opened his Bible to the verse in Proverbs, and he said, look at this. I looked at it carefully. It doesn't say life and death are in the power of the tongue. You know what it says? Death and life are in the power of the tongue. He said to me, do you believe God's a God of order? How are you going to answer that question? Of course. He said, why do you think in the verse it puts death before life? I laughed and I said, obviously I've never thought about it, so why? He said something to me I have not forgotten. He said, Scott, it says death and life in the power of the tongue and puts death first because when we open our mouths, the first thing almost always that comes out is death. And then he said this to me, it takes a work of grace for life to ever come out of us. It's funny, but when people imagine revival preaching, they imagine you're going to preach on everybody else's sins, you know. But here's what I'm learning. I'm learning if we're going to have real revival, we're going to have to let God search our hearts. I'm talking about the good, respectable sins, the ones we excuse, uh, the ones we blame somebody else for, the ones we say, well, that's just the way I am, preacher. You know, that's my besetting sin. And hold up just a second. If we're going to let God be God and Christ be big in our lives, then we must reflect his glory, which means we must allow the Lord to do a thorough work in every one of us. You know what's interesting about this passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 10? Paul said, I want you to know, you think I'm one way from a distance and another way up close. I'm going to be the same both ways. Wouldn't it be glorious if we lived our lives in such a way that whether we were a distance from people or we were right up close to them, they could see Christ in us either way to reflect his glory. Here's the third truth. Would you write it down? I see in this little expression not only the reality of who Christ is and the reflection that is to be in us. But thirdly, would you write down, I see in this the reach to other people. We see Christ, we see Paul. Now look at the church at Corinth. You know what Corinth was? You ready? I'm going to give you a deep theological assessment of them. They were a mess. They were a mess. They were just messed up. And by the way, before you start talking about somebody else being messed up, recognize how messed up you are. That's what sin does. But watch this. In a city that was filled with wickedness, in a world of problems, in a time of strife, in a church with great conflict, there was only one thing that would fix any of that. You know what it was? It was the meekness and gentleness of Christ. I'm going to tell you what I think. Look this way, please. I'm going to tell you what I think. I think for too long we've been trying to fix spiritual problems through carnal means. We've been trying to You know, make it a little better, make it a little better, make it a little better. Could I remind you, gentleness is one of the marks of the fruit of the Spirit, which means you can't work it up and you can't put it on. The Holy Spirit has to put it in you. What's the work of the Holy Spirit? It's to make you more like Jesus. It's for you to be conformed to the image of Christ. In the words of Paul in another place, that Christ be formed in you. Hey, when you got saved, I know that glorious day we talked about, when you got saved, that wasn't the end. That was the beginning. And what is the Lord doing? He's involved in the greatest remodel project in the history of the world right now, in you. He's getting all the junk out of his house and moving all the new furniture in. That's what he's doing. And do you know why? So that through you, he can reach others. 
in the harshest times with the most hateful people, in the hardest situations, there's only one thing that's going to make a difference. It is the meekness and gentleness of Christ. And for the record, if you think, if you think for a minute that this meekness and gentleness implies some weakness, I would challenge you to keep reading in the chapter because two verses later in verse number four, he says through Christ we have his mighty, powerful spiritual weapons that are strong enough to pull down all Satan's strongholds. I'm going to tell you, this is not weakness. This is divine strength. When you come under God's control, he changes everything. Several years ago, I was preaching a revival meeting in South Florida, a wonderful church. I was preaching through the little book of Haggai that week, and Monday or Tuesday night, I think it was, probably Tuesday night, a kind elderly woman in the church came out. I was standing in the lobby, and she shook my hand. She thanked me for the message, and then she said this to me. I, I just stuck in my mind. She said, Preacher, she said, the last few weeks, she said, I've been praying for something. I said, what's that? She said, I've been praying for a Holy Ghost revival. She was an old-time Christian. For the record, we could use some more of those today. I said to her, God bless you, sister. Keep praying for that. I'm praying for that, too. She turned to walk away. She took about three steps. I can see her now in my mind. She turned around and walked right back to me. She said, can I ask you something? I said, certainly. She said, what does that look like? I said, pardon me? She said, that Holy Ghost revival that we're praying for, if it comes, how will we know it's come? What does it look like? You know, we preachers, we like to think we have the answers. I opened my mouth to say something. I don't remember what I was going to say, something I had thought of. And the Holy Ghost checked me. You ever have the Holy Spirit stop you? Like, uh, uh, uh. And I said to her, you know, I need to think on that a little bit. Let me pray about that. I went back to my room that night. I was alone. and Before I went to bed, I knelt to pray. I was praying about something else. And in the middle of that prayer, don't you love when you're talking to God and he starts talking to you? In the middle of that prayer, the Holy Spirit brought that lady's question to my mind. So I said to the Lord, Lord, I don't know how to answer her question. I don't know. I mean, now look, I'm just being transparent with you. I'm an evangelist. Don't you think evangelists ought to know what a revival looks like? I mean, I'm preaching a revival meeting there. Don't you think an evangelist ought to know what a revival looks like? God was teaching me something, you see. God's questions probe. They, they stir something in you, you see. And I said to the Lord, Lord, I don't know how to answer her question. What does it look like? All of my life, I've had certain ideas of what revival might look like. I tell you what revival would be. Revival would be if this place is so packed and jammed. Man, we had them sitting in the lobby. No, no, we had them standing in the parking lot. You couldn't get the people in the building. Somebody said, now that's revival. No, that might just be a crowd. See, the devil can get a crowd. Somebody said, I tell you, preacher, we'd have a lot of people saved. Oh, I think if revival comes, you'll see a lot of people saved. But it doesn't start with the lost people getting saved. It starts with saved people getting right. So that can't be revival. Somebody else said, well, I tell you, we'd have some great preaching and great singing if we had a real revival. You know what I've discovered about real revival? When it does come, nobody talks about the preacher and nobody talks about the singers. And you know why that is? Because everybody wants to talk about Jesus. And this is what the Holy Spirit taught me on my knees that night. He said to me, revival looks like Christ. Why did the Holy Spirit come to lift up who? Christ. Why does the Holy Spirit live in you so you'll be conformed to the image of Christ? Watch this, please. When real awakening, when real revival comes, I'm going to tell you the mark of it. The Holy Spirit starts cutting out of you everything that doesn't look like Jesus. He puts his finger on things. I mean, right now while I'm talking, it's fascinating to me. There's a spiritual work going on. I'm not even listing sins right now. I don't have to. The real preacher's doing that. I just work for him. The Holy Spirit starts putting his finger on individual things and saying, that's got to go. That has got to change. That has got to be yielded to Christ. And at the same time, he's not only cutting that out, but on the other side, he's putting into you more of Christ's character and nature, more of his love and his joy and his peace and his long-suffering and his gentleness and his goodness and his faith and his meekness and his temperance. Look, less of us and more of Jesus. And you'll know revivals come to your heart this week. If when it's all said and done, it's less of you and more of Christ. Oh, Lord, teach me more. Show me more. 
of the meekness and gentleness of Christ. If this Bible message has been used of God in your life, or we can pray for you in some definite way, please contact us at enjoyingthejourney.org. We hope you will share the message with others who may also be encouraged by it. For additional full-length Bible messages, please visit Dr. Scott Pauley's YouTube channel. Tomorrow is the Lord's Day, and we want to encourage you to be faithful to attend a Bible preaching church in your area this Sunday. Thank you for listening to The Weekend Pulpit. And don't miss Enjoying the Journey daily devotional podcast each Monday through Friday.